Welcome back to our study in Nehemiah. We took a break this past week for our annual conference, and I thank you for being patient and coming back and joining me again today. We are now at chapter 8 in our study, well over halfway through this tremendous book that gives us so much practical advice on how we live out the Christian life in our world today. And our focus today is going to be on the Word of God. John Wesley said, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach me the way. And for this very end, he came from heaven. He hath written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let me be a man of one book. The book. The book. We also know it as the Holy Bible, the Word of God. What does the Word of God mean to you? What do you think it means today to our nation? President Woodrow Wilson wrote during his administration the following words, America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelations of Holy Scripture. Would a president say that about our nation today? It doesn't appear so. The Word of God, the Word of God. Well, in Nehemiah's day, they had not a Bible that contained the Scripture, a bound book like we have, but they would have had something more like this, a scroll, and it contained the law, which would be read by priest to a crowd. And it was considered the word of God, and it's what established the nation of Israel. And they were the people of the book, and no other nation has been. And as we've seen with Israel, when God's people get away from the word of God, they lose the blessing of God. And so as we begin chapter 8, we see that the material needs of the city have been met. A community has now been established, and so now the attention turns to the spiritual needs of the people. And we see that what happens in Jerusalem from this point on is a byproduct of how they respond to the Word of God. So let's jump in. Verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man at the square, which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women and those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. The word of God, the word of God at that time wasn't simply set apart for a Sunday, for 45 minutes every Sunday while people sat in a pew. They recognized that ordinary life was to be directed and inspired by the rule and the reign of God. And they didn't have this secular divide going on that we have today. And I want you to notice <clears throat> that everyone stopped what they were doing in order to hear the word. It was something they anticipated, something they looked forward to. And I don't know if you picked up on this, that only those who could listen and understand were actually permitted into this assembly. So what happens when the word is preached and there are people in the room that can't understand. Think about it. Either they fall asleep or if it's a young child, they might be distracting or disruptive so that the ones who really want to hear aren't able to hear. I mean, can you imagine a child, a young child sitting in a service from early morning until midday while somebody simply reads the word? And the word that's being re read is the law, the law, the Ten Commandments? No, this is the law of Moses. 
and the content of the law is spread across the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and then it's reiterated and added to in Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is known as the second reading of the law. Now, I have here in my hand a scroll that contains the bulleted law. And if you could see it and see it completely rolled out, it would go all over the floor in this library. And it contains 613 commandments. Now, this just has the bulleted laws, the 613 commandments, but it doesn't have the details. And what the people were hearing and listening to were the details of the law. <clears throat> so what are some examples of what the scroll contained? Well, it contained the Ten Commandments, moral laws on murder, theft, honesty, adultery, social laws on property, inheritance, marriage, and divorce, food laws on what is clean and unclean, on cooking and storing food, purity laws on menstruation, seminal emissions, skin disease, and mildew. The list goes on and on and on. Feast, the Day of Atonement, Passover, Feast of Tabernacle, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of the Weeks, and all the details that go with those celebrations. Sacrifices and offerings, the sin offering, burn offering, whole offering, sheave offering, Passover sacrifice, meal offering, wave offering, peace offering, drink offering, thank offering, dough offering, incense offering, red heifer, scapegoat, first fruits, etc. Instructions regarding the tabernacle and which were also later applied to the temple in Jerusalem, including instructions about how to uh, take care of the Holy of Holies, containing the Ark of the Covenant, instructions for the construction of various altars that were needed, and then there were um, forward-looking instructions for the time when Israel would eventually demand a king. And can you imagine sitting there for hours listening to all those details being given and read, and yet the people did listen, and they anticipated it. Ezra is mentioned in the beginning. Ezra is the one reading the word. He was a priest, and he was a scribe who had come to Jerusalem about 14 years prior to Nehemiah. And he had been trying to bring the people back to the Lord. You can read about that in Ezra chapters 7 through 10. And this is um, the time of year. It's the first day of the seventh month. It's autumn. This is the celebration of the Feast of the Trumpets. It'd be the equivalent of our New Year's. It's also what we know today as Rosh Hashanah, which means head of the year. And it marks, again, uh, the beginning of the Jewish civil calendar. And during this celebration, no kind of work was to be performed, but burnt offerings and a sin offering were to be brought before the Lord. The Feast of Trumpets was important for several reasons. Uh, first, it co commemorated the end of the agricultural and festival year. Also, the Day of Atonement fell on the 10th day of this particular month, and the Festival of the Booths began on the 15th day. And the blowing of the trumpets on the first day of the month heralded this preparation for the Day of Atonement. And this preparation time was also called the 10 days of repentance or the days of all. And the trumpet would sound an alarm of sorts that could be understood as a call to introspection and to repentance. And so it's almost like our season of Lent in the church today. And so that's the time they're in and they've been going through this time of repentance and introspection, and now they're coming together to hear the word of God. Verse 4, And Ezra the scribe stood at the wooden podium, which they had made for that purpose, and beside him stood, and there's this whole list of names, and I'm not going to read those names. Let me ask you this question. How many of us would take the time to show up for only the reading of the Bible? Is, is God's word no longer enough? 
if we knew our pastor wasn't going to deliver a sermon and take the word of the Bible and do something to help us make it applicable in our lives today, would we come and sit and listen? And so, but people did come and they were anxious to hear. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up for the reading of the word. This quote I found uh, when doing research on this study uh, from Derek Kidner said this, at the dedication of Solomon's temple, there had been glory and beauty, natural and supernatural, so to overwhelm the worshipers. Here, the focus was a scroll and what was written in it. Its opening brought the people to their feet. When we open the word of God today in our homes, in our worship services, does it bring us to our feet? If we took away our buildings, the music, the, and the pastor only read from the Bible, would we come? Would we be inspired? Would we be blown away by the power of the word alone? What's happened? What's happened? Have we become so familiar with it? Is it so easily available at our fingertips that we now neglect it? I mean, most of us have multiple Bibles in our homes and at our fingertips and certainly online. You can get every version you want in just an instant. Have we become neglectful because it is such an easy resource for us to obtain? The Word was made, the Word made understandable to the people. And this was God's plan all along that the people should know and hear the word of God. Verse 6, then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen, while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, and the Levites, and this is important, and the Levites explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. And they read from the book from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. In the Beacon Bible Commentary, it was suggested that the Levites may have acted much like a sign language interpreter does. Ezra would read the law, and then the Levites were assigned to translate it into Chaldaic or Aramaic, the language which had become popular during the exile. Whatever, they made sure that the people understood it. And think about this. The original language of the law would have undergone some changes since the days of Moses. I mean, just like the English language has changed. We need new translations of the Bible, not because the Bible changes, but because our language changes. If I take out the original, the old King James Version of the Bible, and read it to our students today, they're kind of like, huh? Huh? What does that mean? What does this mean? We don't speak that way anymore. Listen to this. The familiar verse of John 3.16, rendered in Middle English. The later Wycliffe version reads this, reads this way, and I'm not doing this quite correctly, but if you could see it, you would see how difficult it would be for us to understand today. For God lowered so the world that he, if his own beget on soon, that ick man that beloweth in him perceiveth not, but how er last leaf. That's what it looks like when you see it written on paper. And none of us could understand that verse today. So we have translations, and that's what the Levites were doing. 600 years, 600 years ago, but between, and that was 600 years ago that that, that John 3.16 was written, but between Moses writing the law and Ezra's reading, a thousand years had elapsed. So think about how that language had changed. The joy the joy that we see here, a joy of the Lord at the reading of the word. Then Nehemiah, who was the governor 
And Ezra the priest and the scribe and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to the Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival, because they understood the words which had been made known to them. So first of all, my question would be, why did the people cry when they heard the law read? Well, probably it was conviction and grief over their sins. Romans 3.20 says this, For by the law is the knowledge of of sin, you don't know necessarily that you've done anything contrary to God unless you hear the word of God. But also they understood all these years they would have not been able to read the law. And they got to read it and hear it this time. They got to hear it uh, on their own. And if they heard it in the past, they would not have been able to understand it. But at this reading, it's being interpreted in a way they can understand, and they are weeping because they finally hear the law for themselves. Think about how it would feel if all you heard of the Bible, ever heard of the Bible, was it in Latin. And then you come on a Sunday, and suddenly for the first time in your life, you hear it read, the words of Jesus, in a language that you can understand, would it not cause you to weep? How do we as Christians show the great joy we have that comes from obeying God's word? Is there a joy that can come when sin is revealed, when we see how we've gotten out of line with what God would call us to do? Is there a thankfulness, oh Father, Thank you for showing me the right way. Thank you for directing my paths. Thank you, Father, for helping me understand. What if Sundays became a day of celebration because we were so filled with the joy of God's Word? Do you think we might look forward to it a little more? Then verse 13, it says, Then on the second day, so they've already had a whole day of reading, now they're back again. On the second day, the heads of the fathers' households of all the people, the priests and the Levites, were gathered to Ezra the scribe that they might gain insight into the words of the law. And they found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. So as the law is read, they discover something they'd forgotten. Another festival is mentioned, and it's the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And during this period of seven days, the Jews lived in booths made of branches, usually built on the flat uh, rooftops of their houses, and it signaled a time of looking back, remembering the nation's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness when the people were homeless and lived in temporary shelters. It was also a time for looking at the harvest blessings they'd received from the hand of God and looking ahead to the kingdom God had promised to his people Israel. It was a week-long festival of praise, thanksgiving, and focusing on the goodness of the Lord. And it was an also, also a time for sending food and gifts to others. You might say it's kind of, it was kind of like an annual camp out or uh, an annual camp meeting. And you can hear the children asking their fathers, now, why are we gathering these branches together? Why are we building this building? And then the father was, fathers would retell the story of Egypt. And this was all done in the community. Have you ever wondered why God put so many feasts and festivals and celebration days into the Old Testament uh, calendar? 
obviously uh, God gets pleasure out of or God enjoys celebration. He wants his people to. And he tells us over and over to remember. There is importance in remembering. Remembering what God has done in our past helps us have hope and courage for the future. So these celebrations all brought about a time of remembering, but also times of rejoicing and feasting for what God has done. So what is the counterpart to some of these celebrations in our church today? Well, some Christian feasts, some Christian celebrations are fulfillments of these various uh, Jewish feasts. And because of this, um, they're very, what we celebrate are very distinctly Christ focus. Um, the Jewish feast for Christians are, were shadows and types of what was to come and what's now been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So, for example, in the Lord's Supper, which would have been the Passover for the Jews, for us, we see the fulfillment of the Passover in Jesus Christ. So let's go on to verse 15. So they proclaimed and cir circulated a proclamation in all their cities and in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and the proclamation said, Go out to the hills and bring olive branches and wild olive branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof, and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God, and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And the entire assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in them. The sons of Israel had indeed not done this from the days of Joshua. And there was great rejoicing. And he read from the book of the law of God daily, from the first day to the last day. And they celebrated the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. Why should we read the Bible daily? And do you read the Bible daily? And what should we remember What's the importance of remembering and why remember? Well, remembrance of God's work in our lives <clears throat> is a theme that runs throughout Scripture. And today, one of the ways that we remember, of course, is our deliverance from sin through Christ's death on the cross. We remember through the service and fellowship of Holy Communion. Of Holy Communion. If you remember the movie War Room, uh, you would remember that there was uh, a wall of remembrance that was talked about. Uh, just a, a wall where there was a post framed, a post-it note framed, uh, that listed uh, events and answered prayer, things that God had accomplished and done. And, and you could just pass by the hallway and see this wall of remembrance and be reminded of the activity and the goodness of God. There's a song that we sing uh, in our church called Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And one of the verses in it says, Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. Well, an Ebenezer means stone of help or stone of remembrance. And so the Israelites had a practice of erecting stones when something monumental happened to mark the site where God had shown up. Uh, every time an Israelite saw a stone erected by Samuel, he would have a tangible reminder of the Lord's power and protection. This Ebenezer, this stone, stone of help, marked the spot where an enemy had been routed up and God had promised to bless his people. And the list can go on and on and on. Remembering Think about establishing possibly in your life a place of remembering, something that marks remembrance of God's work in your life. What about the Christian life is it that gives you the most joy? Remembrance. If you've lost 
your joy over God's amazing grace in your life. Maybe you've lost the remembrance of your past captivity and the remarkable deliverance that God has given us from sin and death. We need to remember our salvation. Nehemiah, Ezra, and the Levites quickly remind the people that this was not a day for mourning. Just because we're remembering doesn't remain, mean we mourn. They remind the people that this is a holy day and holiness and gloom do not go hand in hand. You know, one of the reasons people often don't want to know about Jesus Christ or come to Christ is they have only known Christians to be full of mourning, sorrow, and gloom. And so three times during this scripture, uh, the people are encouraged to celebrate, not to mourn. This day is holy. Do not mourn. That's verse 9. Go eat of the fat. For this day is holy, verse 10. This day is holy, do not be grieved, <clears throat> verse 11. So though at times we certainly need to go into the house mourning our sins and repenting, there are also days when we should blow the trumpets, throw on the stakes, clink glasses together, and celebrate the holiness of God. Remember that Jesus Christ celebrated what is it that you and I celebrate about God? And then we have this very famous verse, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Now, when we talk about joy here, we're not just talking about uh, happiness. What is, what is the difference between joy and happiness? Think about it. Happiness is very circumstantial and it's extremely fleeting, but joy endures. True joy needs nothing but the presence of Christ. <clears throat> and happiness has to be fed like a parking meter. And please forgive me um, for my struggle with my voice today. I've been recovering from the flu, and I'm so much better, but uh, my voice is not completely well yet. Kelly Minter, in her study of Nehemiah, says this, Obtaining joy for me felt much like trying to catch a butterfly with a torn net. I could never quite get at it. The problem was not so much the net, but that I was chasing the wrong butterfly. I ran around grasping and striving for pleasure and happiness, while joy just perched there quietly on my shoulder as if to say, Hey, I'm right here. So how do we experience joy? Well, the verse tells us that it is from the Lord. As a matter of fact, joy belongs to the Lord. Notice that it says the joy of the Lord, indicating that it is a possession of God. Therefore, if it is a possession of God, it can only be given by God and only be taken away by God. No person, circumstance can steal your joy if you have it in the first place. Let me say that again. No person or circumstance can steal your joy if you have it in the first place. And since it is a possession of God, we can only know and understand it by knowing the Lord. And how do we get to know the Lord? Well, His Word that we've been studying today, prayer, Bible study, obedience. So one of the reasons we hear doesn't God want me to be happy? It's because we don't really know God. Warren Wearsby in his commentary said this, The secret of Christian joy is to believe what God says in his word and act upon it. Faith that isn't based on the word is not faith at all. It is presumption or superstition or superstition. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's study. I hope you find that when you take a moment to sit down and spend time in the Word of God, that you appreciate the fact that you can read it in your own language. You can read it for yourself. I hope you find joy in coming into that space where you can sit down one-on-one -on -one with the Lord and His Word and celebrate that and 
celebrate that in your life and remember the joy of the Lord is your strength.